That make you go, hmm. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good? Cool. Hey, I'm going to pray real quick. I'm preaching on the Holy Spirit, and I need his help. So I'm going to pray. So if you guys would pray with me, that'd be amazing. Father, I uh, love you, and I thank you. Holy Spirit, come to you now. Um, I need strength, I need boldness, I need confidence, and so God, only you can give that to me. Uh, Holy Spirit, as I speak about you, let the words come out of my mouth. They are just kindling. I call down fire from you to light it on fire in the hearts of my heart, of other, everyone's heart here. Holy Spirit, we ask that you just give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that Jesus may be made much of, that he would be glorified, and you'd be well pleased. We love you. Pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, there's the cat out of the bag right there, what we're talking about today. We're con continuing our series, Things That Make You Go, Hmm, and looking through theological concepts and doctrines of the Bible that make us kind of scratch our head and wonder. And so this has been an in-depth study to these doctrines, these things. We've talked about God's Word, how it's inspired from God, and how it's infallible and inerrant, and it's, it's good. And we looked at God and said that God is transcendent, yet He's imminent, and uh, we looked at humanity and talked about that we are created in God's image. Then last week we talked about Jesus. Jesus was fully God and Jesus was fully man. And now we get to the Holy Spirit. So my intention today is to lay a foundation on who the Holy Spirit is and where we see the Holy Spirit in the scriptures and how the Holy Spirit works and what this means for us when we live under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So that's what I want to walk through today. Now here's what I know. 45-ish minutes it's not enough time to cover all the Holy Spirit. So I hope today I give you great information. I hope today actually that the Holy Spirit gives you transformation. I pray also that you get like this burden, this appetite to want to know more about the Holy Spirit as we walk through the text today. Now, where do we see him? Where do we see this Holy Spirit laid out? We need to do a little bit of foundational work. Uh, and so I'm going to walk through this. You'll notice in your sermon guide, uh, in your sermon note guide there, there's a lot of scripture at the bottom. So I'll make some references to that because we're going to talk about a lot of bible today okay so where do we see the holy spirit first well we see him in the bible that's where he first shows up uh, we see him right there in the bible we see him not just in the new testament we see him in the old testament as well in the old testament there's references about a hundred times to the holy spirit in the new testament we see him references about 200 times let me give you a few spots we see the holy spirit show up in creation he's part of creation they're hovering over the void we see also progressive revelation happen in the Old Testament to where the Holy Spirit is not completely there as we see in the New Testament, that, but he's progressively coming. We see him on people is what the Bible says. There's guys like David, guys like Saul that, that the Holy Spirit would be on and empower for God's mission. We see also this promise in the book of Joel where the Holy Spirit will be on us permanently by the time of Christ that we will have God in us us and we see him deeply in the old testament there but then we started to see this clearer picture of the holy spirit in the new testament especially in the life of jesus we see so many things happen let me give you just a few there the picture of the holy spirit in the life of jesus we see the holy spirit overshadow mary in the virgin birth there we see the holy spirit upon simeon when he spoke about jesus in the temple we see the holy spirit rest upon jesus in his earthly ministry look at matthew 3 16 and by the way uh, we put the Bible on the screen for you because we want you to be able to follow along and see what the Bible actually says. Also, if you do not have a Bible, we have free ones out back we would love to give you. So just walk by the table and grab one of them. They're right out the door to the left. And then your iPhone or whatever should have a Bible on it well. But Matthew 3, 16 says this. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he came up from the waters. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, descend like a dove coming resting on him and so we see jesus in that part of being fully man he, he is empowered and lives by the power of the holy spirit we also see the holy spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tempted i mean that's a head scratcher right there when you read the text said the spirit of god led him into the wilderness to be tempted and so we see that the spirit of god is there we see over and over and over in the gospels matthew mark luke and john those first four books of your new testament bible we see the Holy Spirit there in, in helping Jesus proclaim this good news. We see the Holy Spirit there casting out demons through Jesus. And we see Jesus was raised by the power of the Holy Spirit. To say it all, from birth to life to death to resurrection, Jesus was empowered 
by this Holy Spirit. So the Bible is full of the Holy Spirit. See, here's the thing about the Holy Spirit. We either underemphasize the Holy Spirit. There's one book that was written a handful of years ago called The Forgotten God. And I think we're a little afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit. Or there's the flip side. There's the overemphasis on the Holy Spirit, making the Holy Spirit, you know, the main talk of every conversation, making the Holy Spirit the main of everything that happens in preaching and music, worship, all that. And there's this overemphasizing. What that leads us is extremely confused or afraid of the Holy Spirit. And I hope today I'll give you a balanced look at what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit straight from the Scripture. So that's where the Bible lands on him. But who is this Holy Spirit? Like, who is he? Let's talk about the person of the Holy Spirit. John 14. We'll spend a lot of time in the book of John. We'll bounce around to some other texts as well. But John 14, starting in verse 16. We need to know a little bit about this Holy Spirit. Verse 16. This is Jesus talking to his disciples the night before, you know, right before he goes to the cross. He said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. That's a capital H, talking about a person. We'll see that that is the Holy Spirit. Another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. So he's saying the spirit is of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees. What's the next word right there? You can say that loud. He never sees him, him, nor knows him for you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you and so we start to see something emerge from this text the holy spirit is not a power the holy spirit is not a force but there's a person of the holy spirit now this is the big deal because not all religions even within christianity not all believe this but the holy spirit is a person he has a personhood i mean when we start to look at the the new testament especially we start to find out something about this person it says that he can be grieved when we don't listen to him, when we do not obey him, a person can only be grieved. A force of power cannot. He intercedes for us in prayer. He testifies to the truth. He speaks. He creates. He has a mind. He can be blasphemed, sin against. But he's not just a person. He's God. We remember a couple of weeks ago we, during uh, this series we talked about God. and We said God lives in a community. We call that community Trinity. Father, Son, Spirit. Three personhoods, three essence. One nature, one God, triunity. That's what we see right here. He's the third person of the Godhead, third person of the Trinity. Now, in the book of Acts, was written by Luke. We kind of see this emerge a little bit more, and I want to show you one more picture of him being a person and him being God. In Luke, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 5, Luke writes this, 1 through 4, we see a community together. See, when the New Testament church started and the Holy Spirit came, they started living in very radical ways and start giving us a picture of what it really looks like for Christians to live together, what it really looks like to have community together. And one of the things they were doing, they were selling their possessions, they were selling their extras, they were selling things, dividing the money out amongst one another, that way they would have food and they would have clothing, they would have shelter, they would take care of one another's needs. This is what true community looks like for Christians, that, that our extra could be someone else's enough. And that's exactly what's going on there. But just like the church then, just like the church now, the church is full of sinful people, each and every one of us, right? And so we see a couple of sinful people do sinful things right here in Acts chapter 5, verse 1. But a man named Ananias and his, with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. Because that's what they were doing. They were selling it and dis dispersing the money. And with his wife's knowledge... He kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Because they were bringing all of it and dispersing it. So no one, you know, would be without. Verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? Now look at this text. To lie to the Holy Spirit. Hang on to that. And to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? Now look at this next phrase. You have not lied to man, but to God. Two things right here in this text. Number one, how do you lie to a force or a power? How do you lie to electricity? How do you lie to the feeling of love? You can't. You lie to a person. And so right here we see that the Holy Spirit is a person. But then what does he say also? They didn't lie just to men, but they lied to Who's he referring to? Holy Spirit. So we see the person and we see the God right there. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is person. The Holy Spirit is a he. Not just a power, not just a force. Huge foundation right there. 
some of you are like, well, I already knew this tithe. Don't take that for granted. Not everyone believes and trusts that. That's kind of a big picture view, 30,000 foot view of the Holy Spirit. Now we need to get a little bit closer, okay? We need to see what does the Holy Spirit do? What is the work of the Holy Spirit? Now I'm not going to give you an exhaustive list because it would take forever to see the power and the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the life of the church. But I want to give you a handful of things. And this is, a lot of it's going to come from John, John 13 through 17. Now, those chapters is Jesus' conversation with his disciples right before he goes to the cross. He knows that he is leaving, okay? And so these are kind of his last words. Could you imagine what your last words would be? Like if you knew, you know, within days that you're going to be done, that life is going to be over. So think through that for a second. It'd be the most important things, right? You wouldn't really be worrying about what's on the DVR, or that Arrested Development Season 4 comes on tonight, or anything like you would I know, two of you. Like, you would not be worried about that right now, right? You'd be worried. You, you wanted to, like, this is like, I've got the final hours. I need to say the most important things. And then what Jesus does in John 16, 7, he says this, which just blows my mind. Please read the Bible, and, and, like, as a, as a text as well, because this is mind-blowing. He says, it is to your advantage that I go. Now, imagine the disciples. They've given up their jobs. They have given up their families. They started living this radical lifestyle. They're going out and preaching and teaching and do all these things. They're following Jesus. They love Jesus. They worship Jesus. They adore Jesus. All this, and Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go. Like, I, that's, that's crazy talk right there. It's like, what do you mean? I mean, it would be so much better. Let's be honest. Wouldn't it be so much better? Or maybe you've thought of this, if Jesus were here with us in the flesh right now. I mean, imagine what that looked like in your life, that you can go to him, which you can, but you can go to him in the flesh and talk to him. You have those conversations with him, which you can in prayer. Imagine this in, in your evangelism, when you're trying to tell people about Jesus and you got that buddy at work that's all skeptical or whatever, you're like, well, hey, why don't you come over to my house tonight at 6 o'clock? Jesus will be there. He'll explain a lot to you. You can check the holes in the side. It'll be good. I mean, like, evangelism would be a lot easier if it was here, but he said it's to our advantage that he goes. And if we read the Bible, we see that after the resurrection, a little time after that, he ascends back to heaven. He's gone. Imagine what that felt like. He said, to your advantage. That just makes me scratch my head. But he gives us a promise throughout this text. He promises the Holy Spirit to be with you forever. This helper, this Holy Spirit, this advocate, this comforter. What does he do? What is his advantages? Let me give you a handful. Like I said, this is not a huge list. Let me give you a handful of these. Number one, he convicts. That's an advantage? He convicts us. He convicts us of what? Our sin. This is good. Look at John 16, 8. It says this, And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. I mean, the word convict is a very strong word, right? When we think of convict, we think of law and legal terms that someone is convicted of a crime, that they are found out to to be wrong or, you know, like they've stolen something, killed something, whatever that looks like. They're convicted, and it's, you know, it's not a good thing. Well, see, the Holy Spirit convicts a sinful, unbelieving world that it's consequently lost and unable to save itself. That's the Holy Spirit's job right there. He reveals our sin and our shortcoming. You're like, Ty, this is supposed to be an advantage. This is not a good advantage. Yes, it is. Can I be honest with you? Like, before Jesus, I wanted nothing to do with God. Absolutely nothing. Like, the whole God factor, I, I, I trusted Christ at the age of 23, was not raised in church. And for me, I wanted absolutely nothing to do with God. I would have never chosen this for my life. I would have never chosen God. I, wanted, I, I didn't see. I had a need for God. I was taking care of everything on my own. I thought I had everything worked out. And I did not want him but at the age of 23 something started happening in my heart something started to change there was this conviction of my wrong and this conviction of my self-righteousness and my my jerkness and there was conviction of all these things like where is this coming from and for some of you i bet that's probably been going on for a little while now like there, there's something inside that's pulling there's something inside you, you know there's a, a void a vacuum there's something that is, that is pulling you to the things of god and you're like i have no idea what this is i can tell you what it is the Holy Spirit. He loves you. He's drawing you in. He's wooing you. He's calling you forward. He wants you. I remember this happening very clearly in my life. See, the, the, this conviction of the Holy Spirit is a great thing. It's painful. It's very painful. It's a great thing. See, unfortunately, at times, we do not want conviction, believer or not, if you're a Christ follower or not. 
we choose guilt. See, guilt and conviction are a little bit different right there. The Holy Spirit convicts, and then we guilt ourselves. See, conviction pushes us outward. Conviction says this, I have sinned against and wronged a holy God. There is something wrong in this universe, and it's me, and it pushes me out of myself. That's what conviction is. Guilt will push us inward. Well, I have done something wrong to somebody, and now I feel bad about it, and now they look in, un, you know, unfavorably against me, and now they don't like me. And so that brings in guilt. And what we do with guilt is, if we got really honest, we love going through guilt cycles in our heart, don't we? Because when we guilt ourselves, we make ourselves feel bad enough, what we'll do is, and here's the word I want to use, we'll self-atone for our sins. If I feel guilty long enough and beat myself up long enough and, you know, bad tie, bad tie, do all that long enough, well then, you know, then I can feel better and we become little saviors that atone for our own sin and that's called guilt. It's guilt driven. Look, people, guilt hung on the cross. Like Jesus took our guilt. There is no guilt left. There's conviction of how we're living wrongly, and that's a beautiful thing that leads us to confession and repentance. But look, guilt tells me I must do more. I must be more. I must be all those things. Guilt turns me inwards to look at myself. Listen to me. We all need to take a look at ourselves, but for every one look you take at yourself, you had better take 10 looks at Jesus because you're going to need it. We press in on ourselves over and over, and what the Holy Spirit does is the Holy Spirit convicts convicts, pushes us out, turns us to Jesus. It's a reminder that Jesus lived a perfect life I couldn't live, that died a death I should have died. Conviction reminds us. The Holy Spirit acts like a big spotlight in our life, exposing the dark spots. That's a beautiful thing. Don't, don't turn away from that. Exposing our sin, exposing our lives if you're a Christ follower today to where we do not line up to Jesus. That's a beautiful thing. It's kind of like this. We live in Las Vegas, right? And like we should, if we have any team sports, any professional sports, they should be called the Las Vegas cockroaches. I mean, that's what like, hey, let's just be honest. There are cockroaches out here. It's not even an insect anymore. It's like an animal. Those things are just big and some fly, some don't fly. Some are crunchier than other when you step on them. They're just really gross, right? Well, in my self-righteousness, I thought, I don't have cockroaches in my house. It's all good. But I, you know what, this weekend, it was just this weekend, I'm going to spray around my house just to make sure, you know, I want to, you know, because that's what you're supposed to do, spray around your house. Dude, I sprayed around my house, and like, my house was all clean, we're all good. All of a sudden, cockroaches started pouring on the outside, just coming out of like the little drain things on the ground and like the watering. It was gross. Well, what did the spray do? The spray exposed what was already there. The cockroaches were already there. It, it's similar to the Holy Spirit exposes, shines a light on sprays to where the cockroaches, the sin, the crunchiness of our life comes out so God can deal with that. Some of you are going to never look at cockroaches the same way. Sorry. See, this convicting work is important. How important is it? It is the beginning stages of salvation. This is word we use, regeneration. I'll probably say this a couple times. Next week, I'm talking about salvation. Next week, I'm talking about regeneration, conversion, like all the big words of the Bible. Next week, I'm talking about that. But this is kind of the big, you know, the conviction comes first. The Holy Spirit must awaken us to our self-sufficiencies and our self-righteousness and our selfishness. It must, he must awaken us to that. I love what Jonathan Edwards says about this. The spirit that is at work takes off persons' minds from the vanities of the world and engages them in a deep concern about eternal happiness and puts them upon earnestly seeking their salvation and convincing them of their dreadfulness of sin and of their own guilty and miserable state that they are by human nature. Do you understand what's going on? Conviction shows us that we can't save ourselves and turns us from the things of ourselves to the things of God. It awakens men's consciences and makes them sensible of the dreadfulness of God's anger and causes in them a great desire and earnest care and endeavor to obtain his favor. It pushes us away from ourselves and towards God. That's what conviction does. See, when the Spirit is at work, we'll not just be embarrassed about our sin and embarrassed about our failures. We will not have regrets over our stakes. No, we will understand the utter offensive nature that our sin has towards God. That's conviction. You're like, man, that doesn't sound like a great thing. That's a beautiful thing makes us more like Christ. You need to welcome God's conviction. When he convicts you, welcome that and run it to Jesus. Number one, conviction. Number two, converts. 
converts, Holy Spirit converts us. A really cool story in John chapter 3, Jesus is approached by a Pharisee. Now, if you've been in church for a while, sometimes we think these Pharisees are the bad guys, right? Like, you know, they're self-righteous and all that. They're bad guys. I'm glad I'm not like a Pharisee. You are like a Pharisee, and I am like a Pharisee. You want me to challenge you on this? All right, let's go. You have an HOA, right, at your house. Everyone, most people here have an HOA. You've probably gotten one of those letters in the mail, probably maybe a certified letter, that has this nice, glossy 8 by 10 picture of that one weed in your yard. Have you done this before? Oh, I've been there. And I look at this one thing, I'm like, how dare they point out this one weed in my yard? It's just one weed right? And then I drive around my neighborhood, and I see that person that has all the, they have like a jungle out in their, in their front yard, right? I'm like, that's awful. That's bad. They shouldn't have weeds in their yard. I'm self-righteous. I'm a Pharisee. That's what the Pharisees were doing right there. That's it. So let's not beat them up too much, okay? So Pharisee there. Nicodemus seems a little different than the other ones. He's coming and approaching Jesus at night, meaning he probably doesn't want other people to see what's going on. And he, he recognized that Jesus is from God because he sees these miracles that he's doing. He's like, man, just average people can't do that. So he recognized these miracles are from God, and so something's got to be going on. Jesus affirms him and says, you're right. You're right. These are miracles. But you're, the miracles is not what's going to save you. Jesus tells him that he doesn't want him to just see the miracles with his eyes. Jesus points to him in John 3, I want you to experience the miracle in your heart. See, there's a miracle going on. How? What did Jesus tell him? Jesus says that we must be born again. What he says in John chapter 3, you can read it right there. Of course, Nicodemus hears that, and like most of us do, like, that's preposterous. You know, I'm a grown man. How can we be born again? It's just physically not going to happen. Jesus affirms this, and right, that's how it happens in the flesh, but you need to be born of water and of spirit. Now, what does Jesus mean by water? Does that mean we have to be baptized, be born again? No. Referring back to some Old Testament stuff, remember, he's a Pharisee, he's going to understand this Old Testament language, that water represents cleansing, but he's talking about the spirit right there, that the spirit gives us new birth, gives us regeneration, that makes us anew, that converts us from dead to alive. This is what Jesus says in John 3, 6 through 8. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel, marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus talks about being born of the Spirit. He talks about being born again. I've heard some people say that I'm a born again Christian. And we just need to be careful with that term. You know why? Because it, it makes us think like there's Christians and there's born-again Christians. If you're not born again, if there's no regeneration, no conversion of the Holy Spirit, you're not born. That, that, does that make sense? In order to say I'm a born-again Christian, it's basically you saying I'm a Christian Christian. Like, what is that? I, that's what it means. It's a, when, you, when we say that, Jesus is implying right here that we must be reborn. This is difficult for us to understand, right? Before I was a follower of Jesus, my heart was beating, my lungs would fill up with air, I had some brain activity, not a whole lot, it seemed like it's growing a little older I get. <laughs> I won't, anyway, I'll let that go. But anyway, I, but I was physically alive, but I was spiritually dead. Typically when the Bible, especially the New Testament, refers to the flesh, talking about our sin nature at times, and our, our flesh, our it is dead. The, the, the spirit of it is dead. Dead. He said, that which is born of flesh is flesh. He's speaking of people. He's not implying that human beings are born with physical bodies. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that human beings are born dead, fallen, that we are dead. The default position of humanity, we're really going to look at this next week, is, is dead, spiritually dead. I don't get that. Okay, let me walk through this. This means that you do not have spiritual life. We are born spiritual dead. We are born dead on arrival. You ever get an electronic that's dead on arrival? It's not cool that we are spiritually dead. Not weak, not ailing, not critically ill, not comatose. It's there's no spiritual heartbeat, no spiritual breathing, no spiritual brain activity. There's nothing. It's that we're born, still born in the spirit. It's dead. I've used this illustration a couple of times. It just really makes sense. If, if you have not seen the movie Sixth Sense, I'm going to kill it for you right now, so my bad. But what is Bruce Willis' problem in Sixth Sense? He's dead. You think that's the problem, but the problem is it's not that he's dead. He's dead, but he thinks he's alive. That's the problem. 
And that's what we have is the problem. People think they're alive, but they are spiritually dead. Just because they have a pulse, just because they breathe, they are spiritually dead. See, it's the work of the Holy Spirit to regenerate, to bring spiritual life into people. That's exactly what this means. Only this, only the Holy Spirit can do this. I've had so many people tell me, like, Ty, if I could only see the miracles of God, I would believe. If I look at where Jesus was feeding 5,000, healing people, if I could only see that, then I would believe. Listen to me. There are still miracles happening today. Listen. It is the miracle of death to life. When someone trusts Jesus, when someone is saved and they believe, they go from death to life. No one else, none of us can do that trick, right? That is a miracle. We have to see that as a miracle. This is what it means. The Holy Spirit converts. Conversion is not, I go from being a bad guy to a good guy. I was dead. I'm alive. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is what he does. Also, he conforms. He conforms. The idea here is the Holy Spirit makes us more like Jesus. He conforms us to Jesus. This is the idea of the big word we use called sanctification, being coming set apart and more like Christ. Look at John 16, 13, and 14. I love this text. John 16, 13, and 14. When the Spirit of truth, there's the Holy Spirit, comes, he will guide you. He'll guide you. Guide you to what? Like Christ. Into all truth, for he will not speak on his own. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Look at verse 14. He will glorify me. Now, who's that me? Because it's very important how you distinguish who that me is. He will glorify me. Who's the me? Jesus. So when I ever ask a question, you throw the name Jesus out there. Ten times out of ten, you'll be right. He will glorify me, Jesus, for he will take what is mine, Jesus, and declare it to you. See, the Holy Spirit works in us in multiple ways. One way is, he, first, he sets us apart in Jesus by cleansing us with Jesus' blood. He saves us, okay? The second, he works in us so we can become obedient to Christ, to look more like Christ, to be more like Christ. That's part of his work. You ever wondered why he's called the Holy Spirit? You ever thought about that? You think through these things. Does it mean that he's more holy than God the Father or more holy than God the Son? No. We see God Father's spirit, so it's not different there. See, the term is attached to his title because of the particular task of his job performing and saving us. He is the spirit that makes us holy. That's what it means. He is the leader in working to make us more like Jesus. He is the one enabling the process by which we are conformed to the image and likeness of Jesus. So what does that look like? What does it mean to be conformed? What does that well, I get the question a lot. I get a lot of questions as a pastor. It's fun being a pastor. I get the question a lot, what is God's will for my life? You ever ask that question? Great question to ask. Not that it's a bad question, but what is God's will for my life? And we'll think in big terms of like, you know, who should I marry? What's God's will for that? And it's great to seek that. Or where should I go to school and college and do all What should be my career? Those are great questions. But let me be very clear with you. The Bible clearly gives you God's will. Some of you are like, man. Finally, I'm going to know God's will. Like, I've been wanting to know God's will. What is God's will? The Bible says it very clearly. You can see it all over. I'll give you one section. I don't even think I'll have it on the screen. Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians 4.3. You can write this down. He says, this is the will of God. Are you ready? Your sanctification. That's the will of God. Now go. We can pray and end it right now. That's the, you want to know the will of God. God's will for your life is to conform to Jesus to be more like Jesus, to have the heart of Jesus, to be sacrificial like Jesus, to love like Jesus, have the attitude like Jesus, have the mind of Christ. That is God's will for us as Christ followers, to be like Jesus, to follow Jesus, to trust Jesus, to love Jesus, to worship Jesus. That is God's will first and foremost. That's God's will. God's will for you. I get questions like this as well. What do I do? I feel like the Lord is leading me. Or I feel like God said to me. I get that sometimes. And maybe sometimes you feel like God is leading you. Listen, the Spirit of God can lead you specifically and tell you where to go and tell you things to do. Absolutely. I feel like God has so clearly told me to move to Las Vegas, to be a part of Grace Point Church, to plant churches all throughout this valley, to to live and die here in Las Vegas and to preach the gospel as I go. That's what I believe God has primarily called me to do very specifically. But listen, the primary role of the Holy Spirit in your life is to lead you to Jesus and holiness. That's the primary role. 
But what happens is we are masters at justifying our sin. And one of the main ways we do it is we blame it on God. We use, and I, I love you so much, i got to do this. We use so much Christian spiritual garbly gook, Christianese, to justify our sin. We do this all the time. We use Christian lingo to do what we want to do. Here's what it sounds like. I love you. I just want to make sure I said that. I'm leaving my spouse because I know God wants me to be happy. I'm taking a break from church because this is what God is leading me to. I'm going to get in a ton of debt and buy all these things because I prayed about it and God has given me peace. Listen to me. I love you so much. I got to say this. Wrong spirit. This is the wrong spirit. You may believe it. However, it is wrong. It's not God. It's not the Holy Spirit. You must test the spirits. The Bible says over and over to test it. How do I test the spirits? Look back at verse 13. What's he called Jesus? Or, or what does Jesus call the Holy Spirit there? The spirit of truth. Truth. See, Jesus is the truth. His words are true. The Bible is true. If, if, you, if you need to test the spirit, you line it up with the Bible. You say, well, I don't know how to line up the Bible. Bible, great. Guess what you need to do? Get in community with other believers as well. And discover and learn all about God's will and, and how God's spirit speaks to you. Don't do it alone. Listen to me. Yep. It blows my mind that us Christians, this is me included, all of us do this, that we will make major life decisions without consulting the spirit, taking it to God's word and make sure it's his word, and being affirmed by God's community. Blows my mind. We'll take jobs. We'll get married. We'll take debt. We'll do all those things by ourselves. Why do we do that? Because you can feel the tension inside of you right now. Why? Because I'm an American. Because I'm an individual. Burger King told me I can have it my way, and I'm going to have it my way, heck or high water, right? We, we do this. We, come on. We do this, right? We do this all the time. Why are we not consulting the Spirit, lining up with the Scripture, and being in community together to affirm that? That's the way it happened in the Bible. That's the way it's been happening for hundreds of years, and we've just poo-pooed it. I'm just telling you, this is what happened. Oh, I'm sorry. Listen. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will never lead you or entice you to do something unholy. It's in his title, holy. I'm just, I'm just saying. If, if you feel like God has led or God has laid on my heart or God has given me peace, please check it with the scriptures in context. Push it into community to make sure. Please do that. I love because I guarantee it'll keep you from making lots of mistakes. Look back at the mistakes on your life. I know mine as well. I didn't consult the spirit. I didn't look through the text and I didn't consult my Christian community. Most of my mistakes would have been avoided if I'd done that. Please, please, please. I don't even know where I'm at now. What does he do? He, he conforms. He makes you more like Jesus. It might not be the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit's role is to illuminate Jesus. Look at verse 14. Jesus says this. He will glorify who? Jesus. This is the role of of the Holy Spirit, to glorify Jesus, not even himself, but it's to point everything to Jesus, not you and me, Jesus. I love what J.I. Packer says about this. It's a great illustration. He was walking to a church, getting ready to preach on this text, and he was praying. He's like, how do I, you know, what kind of illustration do I use to make sure that people get this? And when he walked up, he saw the building from afar. He said this, seeing the building floodlit as I turned a corner and realized this is exactly the illustration my message needs. And this is what he says. When the floodlighting is done well, you know what floodlights are, like spotlights. When the floodlighting is, is well done, the floodlights are so placed that you do not see them. You are not, in fact, supposed to see where the light is coming from. What you are meant to see is just the building on which the floodlights are trained. The intent effect is to make it visible when otherwise it would not be seen for the darkness and to maximize its dignity by throwing all of its detail into relief so that you will see it properly. This perfectly illustrates the Spirit's new covenant role. He is, so to speak, the hidden floodlight shining on the Savior. Or to think of it in this way, it is as if the Spirit stands behind us throwing a light over our shoulder on Jesus who stands facing us. 
That is the role of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. is not to glorify us or even glorify himself, but he is to be the spotlight on Jesus. That's the point. He conforms us to be more like him. Next one. Comfort. Comfort. John 14, 16. Holy Spirit comforts us. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Jesus used the word helper right here. The Greek word for this is parkletos. I'm sure I killed that Greek right there, but uh, our parakletos. Para means come alongside. It's like parachute. You want a parachute to come alongside you, let me tell you. Or a parachurch ministry is like alongside the church. Para is alongside. Kletos means to call. It refers to a family attorney that you would call, that basically a family attorney that's on retainer for you, that when times of trouble, in times of need, in times of counsel, he would be right alongside you to assist the family. What is the family? The church. We're family. We're the family of God, and the Holy Spirit comes alongside and helps us in our time of need. Now, we look at that word there. It's translated in different ways. Maybe your Bible say a couple of different things. Use the word advocate or comforter. So you see helper, advocate, comforter. All three words are correct. It's just different ways to kind of explain that. When we think of the word comforter, we think of someone helping us after we've been wounded. You know, like we've been hurt, we've been battled, and we have battle wounds and all that, and the, and the comforter comes along and kind of bandages us up and helps us out and all those things. That's right. It's accurate. But this sounds very reactive. Remember the context right here. Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm going to be gone. You're going to be without him. The disciples are going to be without Jesus in a very hostile world. The disciples are going to be in a world that hated Jesus, and because they hated Jesus, they're going to hate them. That, that's what you have to understand. Some of the old translations, like the King James Version, I, they use the word comfort. And it comes from Latin. I love the way this is. It's comfortus. It's in Latin. If you're a Latin person, I butchered that. Sorry. I'm from Kentucky. It's comfortus. The two words split apart like this. The word calm means with. And fortis is where we get the word fortified. Or it means strong. With strength. The Holy Spirit is known with strength. Strength. So not only does the Holy Spirit come to us and heal our wounds after the battle, but also gives us strength before and during the battle. Do you see what's going on? So not only is the church a place for the Holy Spirit to be a hospital in which it is, the church is also an army that he with I mean, the church is also the Air Force. Is that better? All right. What is wrong with me? It's, it, to strengthen you before you go to battle. This is the comforter right here. Jesus came to strengthen us by his atoning death on the cross. Now the Holy Spirit is here to empower us to live the life that Jesus has called us to. This is his presence in, in our lives. He is with us is what Jesus said right here. That he's there to comfort us. You know what that makes me think of is, is peace. The Holy Spirit is to give us peace as well. Why is this so important? I know my heart, and I would assume my heart's about as bad as yours. I assume probably my heart's even worse than yours. And it's like my life sometimes feels like the guy on the stage spinning plates. You know, like they, you know, they're just running around spinning plates. And peace is a high commodity for me, just wanting peace. The Holy Spirit offers peace that passes all understanding, the Bible says. You can't even understand. The Holy Spirit offers comfort. And see, peace in our lives is not the absence of crisis. It's the presence of Christ. That's what peace actually is. And the Holy Spirit is that comforter right there to give you peace before, during, and after the battle. He is the helper, the comforter, the advocate on our side. That's part of the work of the Holy Spirit. Also, competent. I wanted to use a C word. It means equip. The Holy Spirit makes us competent. What does that mean? He, he equips us for, for the life of ministry and life of service. Now, let me just ask you a question. You don't, don't answer out loud. Who is called to ministry? Just the people who stand on stage and get paid by the church or do things like go overseas or whatever? Or is every Christian called to ministry? Think, think about that. Don't answer it. Okay, let me read a text. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7, it's Paul talking. Sorry, I don't have a lot of context work to do here, time restraint. Paul says this. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. 
And there are a variety of services, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it is the same God. Just real quick, do you see the Trinity right here? Spirit, Lord, God. Okay, just want to show that. Who empowers them all in who? Everyone. Do you know what the Greek word for everyone is? Everyone. Every time. It's great. It's everyone. Verse 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, let me just say this real quick. Um, speaking in tongues. I just, I'm going to just, re- you can read this on your own. Uh, do you have to speak in tongues in order to be a believer? No. Can people still speak in tongues? Yes. I've got some brothers that still do that. They do it in a very biblical way. I have not spoken it, ever spoken in tongues, but it's still a gift, and there it goes. Now, you've got to go deal with that. Okay. So, the Holy Spirit makes you competent. Every Christian is gifted by the Spirit for service. This means you can serve. This means you are to serve to build up the body. This means that as Christians, we serve the family as well. Who is the family? It is the church. This means that you must serve. This is what this means. Church is not like going to a basketball game. Let me give you just a weak illustration. It'll fall flat on its face, but I hope it gets to the point. Who is the greatest basketball player who ever lived? Anybody who said LeBron James, you're wrong. I rebuke you in the name of the Lord from the stage. Or Kobe Bryant, just saying. Michael Jordan, just make sure we all got, there we go. Thank you very much. So, now listen to me. This is going to fall a little bit, but okay. We're going to see here in a moment the Holy Spirit lives in us. So, imagine that the church is not a basketball game. You have the skill set of Michael Jordan living inside of you, and yet... You're sitting on the bench, and for some of you, you're not even on the bench to get into the game. You're in the crowd, and let me speak to the camera, and some of you are online and not even in the arena, okay? So listen, we have the Holy Spirit's power living in us that that works out through us, that gives us gifts and and, and talents and all that to build up the body, to build up the family, to, to care for the family. This is what this is about. Well, you know, it, it's, well, Ty, I don't know my spiritual gift. Listen to me. I love you so much. Here we go. Stop taking online spiritual gifts tests. Stop doing it and just, just get somewhere and serve. I'm telling you. It's like if I don't find my gift, then I don't know where I'm going to serve. Just serve. Look, where do I serve? How do I know to serve? Do you have a burden from God? Like something just keeps you up at night. Something that you just can't, like, I, like, this, like there's people hurting. There. I want to be a voice for the voiceless, and there's human trafficking. There's, there's kids. There's all these, like, wh- what is the burden from God? Line it up with Scripture. Make sure. Make sure. Where is there a need? Well, I can't serve if I don't have a gift back in that area. Are you kidding me? We're a family. I could sit here and tell my wife, baby, I can't wash dishes. It's not a part of my spiritual gift. <laughs> or I'm going to get in there and serve where there's a need. And Do you understand? Or let me, I'll say this as well. What do you go home and complain about from church on Sunday? Well, you know, I, you know, I wish, the, the, you know, I wish I could, the band would do this, or I wish the preaching would do this, or I wish the kids' ministry would do this. I wish they had more people back in the kids' ministry, or I wish the coffee tastes like this, or I wish you know, the signs would be like this, or I wish they put more signs out, or I wish the setup and tear down, whatever it looks like. What do you complain about? Great. God has given you a burden. You have been equipped. Now go. There you go. That's fine. That's, every, that's everybody on Set Up and Tear Down clapping right now. Like, come on. No, I'm just kidding. I kid, I kid, I kid, I kid. Listen, you're, you're competent. If you are a Christ follower today, you are competent for ministry. You can doubt yourself all day long great. Moses did, David did, all of them did. That's great. You're in, a good, you're in good company. It's called a little bit of humility. Great. Awesome. Now, the Holy Spirit, if you're available, can use you. It's, it's beautiful. Competent. I can go on and on. There's more works of the Holy Spirit. Um, but we're going to move on. Location. Where is the Holy Spirit? If you are a believer and follower, a disciple of Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives in you. Look at this. Romans 8, 9 through 11. So all this I've talked, this work of the Holy Spirit, this power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Romans 8, 9 and 11. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God, what's the word? dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Now, we see Spirit of Christ. Same Spirit. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Christ, Father, where's the Holy Spirit today? 
You are God's Tupperware. Your contain a vessel, jar, whatever you want to call it, right? That th this God dwells in you. I've got to read this Calvin quote. I'm going to go over just a little bit. This Calvin quote is great. John Calvin says this: How do we receive those benefits which the Father bestows on His only begotten Son? Not for Christ's own private use, but that He might enrich the poor and needy men. First, we must understand that as long as Christ remains outside of us, we are separated from Him. All that He has suffered and done for salvation of human race remains useless and of no value to us. So how do we get this? He goes on to say this. The Holy Spirit is the bond by which Christ effectually unites us to Jesus. When you have the Spirit, you have Jesus. When you have Jesus, you have the Spirit. He is the guarantee, of, Paul says in Ephesians, He is the deposit. You have the Holy Spirit. All right, so what? Ty, thank you very much. Now I know a little bit about the Holy Spirit. What, so what? I got to go to work on Monday. I got a marriage I got to deal with. I got kids. I've got all bills to pay. So what? Let me end. It's Ephesians 5.18. <clears throat> Paul wrote this book. Beautiful book. Talks about in the beginning how awesome Jesus is. And then it talks about how he loves the church. And talks about how we live in light of all that. It's beautiful. Ephesians 5.18 says this. And do not get drunk with wine. For that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Listen to me. When you are drunk, you are under the influence. Okay? So, Ty, why are we going on a drinking, anti-drinking campaign right here? I'm not. I'm, I'm reading this, the text, the way the text is. This is not what this means. Paul, Paul is saying right here, don't get drunk. So if you're getting drunk, that's sin. So Paul is saying it, but there's a greater implication he's talking about here. When most people are drunk, we use the term they are under the influence, which means they are controlled by it. It affects how you think, it affects how you talk, it affects how you act, because you are under the alcohol's control or any other kind of substance, you are under its control. You've been around anyone, you understand it changes them. How does it change them? Well, sometimes it gives people crazy confidence, right? We call it liquid confidence. You know, some kind of nerdy guy would never talk to a girl whatsoever, but you get him loaded up, he's like Don Juan Rico Suave with a girl right? Some people call it truth serum to where when you get enough of it in you, you start speaking the truth of what's really in your heart. And so it brings out the truth in you. Or some people just lose all faculties and just like they're out of their mind. It's like they have left all responsibilities and the world behind. Paul's implying so much more than being drunk right here. You're under the influence, whatever that substance is, it controls you. And Paul says, but be filled with the Spirit. So if he's making a, a connection right there, instead of being under the control of a substance or a thing or whatever, instead of being under the influence of something else, he says, be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what he's talking about right here. Let me ask you a second uh, question real quick, Christ follower. Who or what has got you under its control? Is it Christ? Are you under the control, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, or is it something altogether different? I mean, we get drunk on a lot of different things. We have drank 200 proof of ourselves. That's probably the most thing we get the most drunk on is us. We think the world revolves around us. We think everything is about us. And so it's about me, 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 to where we are drunk silly on ourselves. We are controlled by our selfish desire that dominates everything in our world, and it makes life a mess because you were not purposed for that. We are drunk on ourselves. We're drunk on comfort. If things make me uncomfortable, if things, I don't like the way they sound, I don't like the way this is, then I just jump out, I just bail, this marriage is uncomfortable, I'm out. This church is uncomfortable, I'm out. If things become uncomfortable, we just say, I'm out. Why? We are drunk on comfort. We are drunk on sex. Oh my gosh, the porn rates are just out of the roof. Why? Because we're drunk on it. We are under the influence of so many other things when right here Paul is telling us to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We're under the influence of security. If I just get more money, I'll just feel better about myself. And it dictates everything I do in my life to where I work, work, work with no end in sight. That way I can amass more stuff to make me feel better. We're drunk. We're drunk. Paul says right here, be under the influence. You look at me, Ty, and you, you say, Ty, I am not drunk. You ever been around drunk people? That's usually the first thing they say just to let you know they're not drunk. <laughs> I'm not drunk. Yeah, you are. Right? You're in denial. That's where you're at. You're drunk. What do we do? You got to start listening to the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christ follower today, 
I just want to talk to you. You have to start listening to the Holy Spirit. See, we've thrown, we've grieved him enough and thrown enough water on him that he is, the fire is not as big as it should be. It's still a burning coal, still there, but you need to listen to him. Today, during communion, during confession, we have an opportunity for you to confess and repent. What is the Holy Spirit convicting you of today? Do not let that pass over. You know what? You might just want to not take communion today and sit there in your seat and just confess to God. He is faithful to forgive your sin. What is God, what is God showing you right now? What is it, how is he trying to conform you more like Jesus? Listen and obey that. Don't let this conviction pass. Where is God convicting your heart? Where is he calling you to serve? Where is he calling you to give? Where is he calling you to love? Where is he calling you to forgive? What is that? What does he want to break you from? What is the thing that you're drunk under? He says, be drunk with me. Gosh, in Acts chapter 2, when they were, you know, this whole thing's going, they got the spirit, like people thought they were drunk. Like, dude, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you're already drunk. I mean, it looks different. It looks different. Be filled up with him. Guzzle him down. Let the Holy Spirit be filled. I'm going to pray in a moment for this, but listen. I don't want my life to be explainable without the Holy Spirit. What about you? Our, our lives as Christians are so easily explained without the Holy Spirit. Why? Why do you think there's a dying world out there that says the church is no good? Because we're drunk on everything else but the Holy Spirit. If you don't know Christ today, there's no Holy Spirit there. Listen, is he drawing you in? Is he convicting you of your self-sufficiencies? Is he convicting you of your wrong? Is he convicting you of you trying to save yourself or run for something? Then listen, today, like at the end of the service, we'll have some people up here. You can trust Christ today. You can confess and repent and by faith trust him. That's it. That is it. And live your life following him. That's it. He says he will give you the gift, the Holy Spirit, that God will be in you. I'm going to finish with this from uh, Eugene Peterson, wrote this book, translation of the Bible called The Message. It's really cool. This is what he says in Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. He says, don't drink too much wine. That cheapens your life. Drink the Spirit of God. Huge drafts of Him. Two fisting, just drinking in God. Sing hymns instead of drinking songs. Sing songs from your heart to Christ. Sing praises over everything. Any excuse for a song to God the Father in the name of our Master, Jesus Christ. You need Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, please, I beg you, convict hearts. Give eyes to see and ears to hear that you would turn us. For Christ followers, God, convict us. Let us still listen to that still, small voice inside of us. Let us be obedient today. Father, whatever sin you've called us to, let us confess and repent. You are faithful to forgive. Instead of running from, let's run to. God, please, please. Holy Spirit, I also ask today for those who do not know you, that you are drawing them near. I pray today you would draw them near into your love, that they would know they were loved so much by Christ, so much so he lived a perfect life, died a death on the cross, and three days later rose victorious over sin, Satan, and death. I pray today they would trust you, Jesus. I pray that you would do this only the supernatural act that you can to make people go from death to life. We love you, Jesus. We pray this all in your name. Amen.